Coming up next on Chicano, the history of the Mexican-American civil rights movement. In 1965, Mexican-American farm workers were fed up with inhumane treatment and poor working conditions. Come on up, brothers. We are waiting for you. They walked off many California fields and refused to pick grapes. Led by Cesar Chavez, a new union changed the way the world looked at Chicanos in America. Relive the story of the struggle in the fields. September 1965. Mexican-American farm workers walked off the fields and refused to pick grapes at many California vineyards. They were tired of exploitation and inhumane treatment. They demanded the same opportunities that other Americans had. A living wage, education for their children, decent housing, to live without fear. They staked their claim by shouting, Huelga, the Spanish word for strike. It soon became the battle cry for the Chicano movement. Joaquin Valley is a fertile agricultural region stretching 500 miles through the center of California. In the early 1960s, migrant farm workers who picked crops in these rich fields knew only misery and poverty. Mr. Pena, how much do you earn a year? Oh, well, about 2,500 a year. No. How much education have you had? None. <laughs> Never been to school? Well, yeah, a few years. And so. uh, can you read? Not too good. <laughs> How much have you been getting for a day's work? Only two dollars. Two dollars a day? Yes. You have a little boy. Would you like him to be a farm worker? No, sir. I've been working all my life in fields, and I don't think it'd be the best place for him. I'd like for him to get a good ed education. Farm workers, unfortunately, were considered just another uh, item in producing products like uh, fertilizer or boxes or water. Most growers didn't treat their workers with any degree of respect or dignity. The life of a migrant farm worker was harsh. Long days of back-breaking work in the hot sun, exposure to poisonous pesticides, all for substandard wages. Life expectancy was 49 years. Education was usually limited to two or three years of school because children often had to work in the fields with their parents. The farm worker was trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty and illiteracy. I grew up into an agricultural area that, that was segregated uh, in a sense that it separated farmers from farm workers and it separated the races completely. My family, they were migrant workers but that is very very difficult because you absolutely have no control of your living conditions and there's just no way of knowing what the crop season is going to be like just like all my brothers and sisters and just like most of the people in the community we all grew up in the fields the only way that we could really put some roots down and to get an education was to have like a home base 
because that was one of the things that we saw that with the migrant families in particular, that they were pulled out of school all the time and they just really didn't have a chance to get much of an education. Economic rights are the essence of human rights. Uh, first of all, uh, every study shows you that without economic rights, you don't have educational rights. When you are in a rural area, you're very vulnerable, especially if you are living from hand to mouth. There is very little integration of other ideas that is taking place when you're constantly moving. You never form a sense of place. You're constantly worrying if you're going to uh, have enough money to pay for the gas, or you're going to have enough money to, uh, to buy the food. It's a tremendous feeling of isolation, fear, where a, a rancher can do almost anything that they want with you. Past efforts to sustain a union among farm workers in California had failed. In 1964, U.S. officials put a stop to the Bracero program, which had allowed the legal importation of temporary farm workers from Mexico. The end of the Bracero program reduced the workforce available to growers, and California farm labor organizers saw an opportunity. In the summer of 1965, Filipino workers called a wildcat strike against grape growers in the Coachella Valley, 150 miles to the east of Los Angeles. The strike was won in one week because Coachella is a hot country and grapes ripen by the seconds, almost by the seconds. So what you did not pick today, it is ready tomorrow waiting for us to come in. Come on and pick me I'm reading. The Coachella growers quickly gave in to the Filipinos' demand for a dollar and 40 cents an hour. Now the workers set their sights on the grape harvest to the north, near the town of Delano. With a large Mexican-American workforce available to them, Delano growers refused the Filipinos' demand for a wage increase. striking Filipinos quickly discovered that they had lost jobs and shelter as well. Our home was right there in the, in the camps. Growers threw out the belongings of some of those strikers in the camp where they were, outside of the rooms, locked their rooms. We slept in our cars under the trees surrounding the community hall. The Filipinos knew their strike would fail without the support of the NFWA, the National Farm Workers Association, a recently formed organization of Mexican-American farm workers. Our plan had been to quietly organize like for five years and to try to get the whole San Joaquin Valley organized before we even talked about doing anything like a strike. Then when the, the strike happened, well, everything, you know, just changed. With the Filipinos on strike, Mexican-Americans now had a decision to make. Most considered it a no-win situation. There was no strike fund, farm workers had no savings, there was no money to support a walkout for even a few days. In Delano, families lived on a day-to-day -day basis, constantly on the edge. The strike could be a financial disaster. To get involved, you had an awful lot to lose because the bosses of the fields were threatening everybody left and right that they would lose their jobs or they would not be hired or there were even threats of deportation for some of the people who were like more recent arrivals. So it was pretty frightening on that level. I mean, there were times when uh, people were afraid to meet in their homes that you had to go meet somewhere else, you know, like in a park or down by the river or something because they were afraid if somebody would find out and tell the labor contractor or the grower and they would get fired. The NFWA called a, a strike meeting to see whether they would officially join the strike and it was on September 16th which as you know is Mexican Independence Day and for any good Mexican you know September 16th I mean we're all feeling full of revolutionary fervor and patriotism and People started talking about how unfair what the growers were doing and why we needed to fight back. And then a guy gets up and starts talking. I said, oh, that must be Caesar. 
and he was tall with a mustache, very distinguished looking. I was very impressed. And then he says, now I want to introduce you to Cesar Chavez. And so then Cesar gets up and he's this little guy, you know, he's, uh, very soft-spoken. That's Cesar. You know, I just wasn't very impressed, but the more he talked, the more I thought that not only could we fight, but we could win. We'll never stop. Our job will not be done until every public is organized. That was fertile ground. I mean, we were, we were angry. Many of us were afraid. Uh, many of us didn't know what to do. But we were just waiting. Uh, we were somebody just waiting for somebody to throw a match. And, and that's what Caesar did. El día 8 de septiembre de los campos de Deleno salieron los filipinos. Y después de dos semanas para unirse a la batalla salieron... The National Farm Workers Association voted to join the strike. With only $87 in its treasury, union leaders prayed that the work stoppage would be brief. Farm workers tightened their belts and bravely faced an uncertain future. Workers were thinking of the strike in terms of days, or even weeks, not years. My family realized that we weren't going anywhere, that we had a lot at stake, and that we had to basically stay and fight. That even, like my mother said, even if we starved to death, that we would not be alone, but that we had to stay and fight, because otherwise nothing was going to change. Viva la revolución, arriba con nuestra unión, viva huelga en general. All I can say is that the men have to be the judges of their own, what they want. And these men have chosen this type of work, just like farming. Uh, anybody will tell you that farmers are taking the poorest of economics, but yet this is my choice. So the same with these workers. They have chosen this way of life, and if they were not happy, they wouldn't be here. Not all growers were nice people. They just wanted to get their job done. Others were very compassionate to, to, to their workers. And uh, so you can't uh, just categorize them all as bad guys or good guys. We came from a hard working family, poor people. A lot poorer than a lot of these workers that worked for us. Of course it was a different time, a different period, but we were sympathetic to the working person because we did it. Most of the growers in the Delano area settled there in the 1920s and 30s. They came from southern and eastern Europe. Every one of these growers, such as my father and others, they were immigrants. They came here with, with nothing but their hands. And so they were sympathetic to the worker. And they wanted to be fair. What we can't afford, we can't give. Land was cheap because at the time the valley was a semi-desert. An ideal climate for grapes and other crops requiring year-round attention by farm workers. In 1951, the growers received a windfall when the federal government brought water into the San Joaquin Valley, in effect, subsidizing the growers' irrigation needs. This abundant water supply dramatically increased the valley's yield and transformed small farms into thriving agricultural businesses. I worked in a lettuce patch when I was 13 years old. It's back-breaking work, and it's hot work, and it's dirty work. My memories, working as a child in the fields, would be summarized in long, long hours, hot fields, having to work in hot fields, feeling that that was it, that's what it was going to be. You know, it was going to be always working in the fields. You know, we live in horrible conditions, we get paid lousy wages, our kids don't have any kind of hope of going to college or being something different if they want to be something different. Basically, we were seen as being ignorant, as being lazy, as being stupid, as being dirty. And that's why we were farm workers. And that's why we were poor. There was a natural scenario for bitterness by um, farm workers who felt they were treated with uh, 
so in some cases with humiliation, were fired without cause. Perhaps there weren't adequate toilet facilities or fresh water. And those were all things that uh, were legitimate grievances by workers that farmers uh, were negligent to uh, improve upon. Come on up, brothers. We are waiting for you. You are earning more money today because the workers here were not on strike on September the 9th, and they are still on strike. Does it make you feel good to know that you are taking your brother's job? Come on, the NFWA brother. pleaded, cajoled, and sometimes embarrassed reluctant farm workers into joining the walkout. To be successful, the strike needed a strong, unified stand against growers who had power and money on their side. Read it and sign it. Les corté un papel para cada uno. Three weeks after the walkouts, close to 3,000 farm workers were on strike, affecting dozens of farms in the southern San Joaquin Valley. fighting for recognition, which is the, the real guts of it. It doesn't matter now how much money they're offered, they wouldn't go back because what they want is a union before they go back. Let me ask you this, what do you think of the idea of a union for farm workers? Well, I think it's uh, ridiculous. Why do you say that? Well, I said I won't go into that with you either. You ask me what I think, this is what I think. Uh, I will say this, farm wages in the last 12 months right in this area has increased from a dollar ten to a dollar sixty an hour. Isn't that because of the strike? No, that's nothing whatever to do with it. What is that because of? I, I'm not going to go on into these questions with you. What, one other question. Uh, uh, do you think that without a union the farm workers can improve their condition and, and create... It business? has been done right here. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit. Is this camp evidence of that? This camp has greatly improved in the last year. Would you want Since to live? I have been here. Would you want to live in this campus? I wouldn't live here. The you know, you're being very impudent. Would I want to live here? This is, I call, an impudent question. The growers fought back, bringing in replacement workers by the busload, attacking strikers with legal injunctions. We have to be 60 feet from that, from that property line, 60 feet from this property line, which puts us somewhere up in the air. For all intents and purposes, we have no right to pick it. The reason we couldn't win the strike in the fields was because the growers had access to an endless supply of strike breakers. They had all kinds of access to injunctions that would limit the effectiveness of our picket lines so that we couldn't speak to the strike breakers. So if we can't stop the grapes here, where they're being harvested, then where can we stop it? And so logically, the next place to stop it would be where it goes. Strike leaders took their struggle out of the fields and into the marketplace, calling for a nationwide consumer boycott against grapes and grape products. As long as you're fighting solely on grower turf, you're fighting in effect with one hand tied behind your back. So when you start to boycott, what you're doing is you're expanding the playing field. Out of more than 30 growers being struck, two were targeted for boycotts. Shenley Ranch, owned by Seagram's, and the DiGiorgio Corporation, which produced Tree Sweet and S&W products. You've got to get out there with a picket sign and, and get some action going. And when you put all of those things together, then nonviolence works. And the only way I know to organize... As the strike continued, it became more than a labor issue. And Cesar Chavez became more than a labor leader. We know that those of you who came from the outside, from distant places to be with us, have, you have come here and sacrificed to yourself and to your family. Believe me, we appreciate your efforts and we invite you to come with us and come and visit us again and again. Uh, here in Delano, where you have many, many friends now. Cesar also made it a movement, a civil rights movement, and he made this clear that it was a civil rights movement. It was not just another union. You see, it was just not another labor strike. He was a national civil rights leader. And he was talking about the same things as Martin Luther King, nonviolence. He was talking about human rights. 
that went beyond the, just the economic aspect the unions operate. The, you know, getting more wages, better labor conditions. How about the children? How about the racism in the school? You see, how about the local cops? And these are the things that the farm workers were about. Responding to the boycott, the Senate Migratory Subcommittee opened hearings to investigate the plight of farm workers. Senator Robert Kennedy interrogated the local sheriff, trying to understand why striking workers were being arrested. If I have reason to believe that there's going to be a riot started and somebody tells me that there's going to be trouble if you don't stop them, then it's my duty to stop them. And well, then I... you go out and arrest them? Well, absolutely. And charge them? Charge them. What do you charge them with? Well, violating uh, unlawful assemblage. Who told you that they're going to riot? The men right out in the field that they were talking to said, if you don't get them out of here, we're going to cut their hearts out. So, so rather than let them get cut, you remove the cause. This is the most interesting concept, I think. The fact that somebody makes a report about somebody's going to get out of order, perhaps violate the law, and you go in and arrest them. They haven't done anything wrong. How can you go arrest somebody if they haven't violated the law? They're ready to violate the law. In other words... But I suggest from the luncheon period of time that the sheriff and the district attorney read the Constitution of the United States. Two significant things came out of those hearings. One was just the fact that Bobby Kennedy came to Delano. And he got to meet Caesar, he got to meet the other leaders of the National Farm Workers Association. And secondly, the hearings just gave visibility to the Delano strike. I mean, it, it did the opposite of what the growers wanted. The growers wanted invisibility and localization and, you know, crush it locally. That's the strategy. For the strikers, the more or statewide and national publicity, the better. We have to come clearly to the conclusion that it ignored the part of our population have been the farm workers. That the farm workers have suffered in our society over the period of the last 30 years and that that situation has to be changed. Farm workers had been on strike for five months with no solution in sight. Union leaders needed to find a new way to win over the American public. Cesar Chavez decided to make a peregrinación, a pilgrimage. Starting in Delano, he planned to march 300 miles to the state capital in Sacramento. Along the way, he hoped to recruit enough men, women, and children to focus national attention on the farm workers' cause. Marchers realized that their route would pass through hostile territory in the heart of the San Joaquin Valley. Van marchando a Sacramento, nuestra gente mexicana. It opened the farm worker struggle beyond Delano, and it was to take the message of the farm worker struggle to farm workers all up and down the valley. The other thing that it did was take head on the fear that most people felt in the valley. So you kind of grew up or lived with this uh, kind of unspoken fear of knowing that there were there was the this side and that side of the tracks that there were places you couldn't go that there were uh ways you would be treated the san joaquin valley is is full of those limitations of those barriers and those lines that you never crossed well this march crossed them it crossed them all it was to me a literal taking of the territory as the marchers passed through each town, more and more sympathizers came out to join their pilgrimage. Each night along the route, they attended rallies and listened to updates on the boycotts against Shenley and DiGiorgio. 
resolver el problema de la huelga en Deleno. Each morning began with mass, and then the marchers fell in behind the patron saint of the Mexican people, the Virgin of Guadalupe. She represented the very soul of the people. It fused everybody into one raza, so to speak. Uh, but it also legitimized us in the sense that it told the world, okay, we are followers of the Virgen de Guadalupe, we're not followers of Karl Marx. These religious gestures angered many of the growers, who normally knelt and prayed in the same churches as the marchers. You're talking about people that attended St. Mary's Catholic Church in Delano, along with Caesar. You know, that's where I was baptized, I mean, well, along with all the farm workers. And they considered themselves to be on the side of God, like everybody else. These are good people, these are good, hard-working immigrant descendants. So when Caesar began to implement the uses of religious imagery in his struggle, many of the growers resented it, took it personally. They said, we are not the devil. We are also Catholics. Consequently, the church, in trying to relate to this struggle, found itself torn. On the one hand, there was this very powerful, moneyed, and uh, political constituency that the growers represented, that was important to the church. And on the other hand, these were the poor, the working poor. Wedding two, three, go! At rallies along the march, the farm workers' theater, Teatro Campesino, performed skits ridiculing the growers. Originally created on the picket lines, the teatro now recruited local farm workers to be actors in the plays. Oh, hello, baby! Hey, hey, baby! Don't do that, boy! I found out that one of the hardest things for me to do was to get campesinos to act like growers. Boy! How would you like to be a rancher for a day? Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yeah, but you're not. But the moment that they did the boss, they changed. They became better organizers. They became, like, confident and in control of themselves. And Caesar saw this. So the teatro started to develop a lot of the early organizers that, that the union sent to places, sent them out into cities to work on the boycott, or, or sent them out to other areas to organize farm workers, who became a source of organizers, just strictly on the strength of self-expression, of speech and drama. <laughs> That was the very first time in my life that I had ever seen art being used on that level. And it made a major impact on me. We still claim that there are reds and agitators. Oh. Now, now, hold on. Hold on. Among you Mexicans. Chicano art had a very, very important role within the Chicano movement. It gave visual form to our dreams, our aspirations, our struggles. Because we did not own the media, we didn't own the television, we didn't own the radio, we didn't own the movies, we owned nothing at all. The only way that we could, in, in many respects, get the word out, be visible, was to create posters, murals, paintings, banners, whatever. It took that form and in that way we were able to disseminate information. You know, not only the positive things, but the negative things. I mean, who we are, our indigenous roots and, and our connection to the land, our love of family and home and community. Twenty-one days into the march, the line of demonstrators stretched for miles through the San Joaquin Valley. And news arrived from Delano. The Shenley Corporation, concerned about negative publicity for its Seagram's label, was ready to negotiate. The farm workers had won their first victory. 
How'd you feel when they when you stopped all of a sudden? They told you that uh, Shenley had. No, oh, I felt like up. hugging everybody. <laughs> I mean, you know, all of us were all together. We we're all marching and everything. We were just about giving up hope, man. We, we didn't think anybody would, you know, cooperate. But when we heard about, we were real happy. All right, sure felt good, by God. Still refused to negotiate. They announced that they will not recognize the association and they will not bargain with us. So, que siga la huelga. Easter Sunday, 1966. After 25 days on the road, 10,000 marchers arrive at the state capitol in Sacramento. It was a triumphant moment in the history of farm labor. As he had done so many times during the march, Cesar Chavez read from the plan of Delano, which clearly laid out objectives of the farm workers movement. The Mexican race has sacrificed itself for the last 100 years. Our sweat and our blood have fallen on this land to make other men rich. This pilgrimage we make symbolizes the long historical road we have traveled in this valley alone and the long road we have yet to travel. August 1967, the farm workers had been on strike for almost two years. After a bitter struggle, the DiGiorgio Corporation finally signed a contract with the farm workers but 28 other growers still refused to negotiate. We still had this strike going on, and the grape companies, they had not sat down to bargain with us. And we decided then to go after the biggest grape grower, which was Jamara, who has about 4,000 workers. John Jamara Sr. had a whole panoply of legal forces, and they got an injunction, which limited our picketing, so the strike was somewhat weakened. We then decided that we were going to boycott Jamar's label, and we started boycotting just Jamar grapes. But then Jamar started using everybody's labels, so before you knew it, we were like boycotting like 58 labels or something. So we started to boycott the whole industry, since the whole industry seemed to be coming to Jamar's aid. The whole point of the boycott was to put enough economic pressure on the growers to get them to sit down and talk. That's all we wanted, was to get them to sit down and talk like reasonable people about what conditions and what wages people would work for. I know of no grower in the Delano area who has refused or who would refuse to sit down and to talk with the workers on his farm, on his farm whether it's dealing with wages or housing or other working conditions. But not with the union organization. But they, they do not feel that the organizer and the agitators represent their workers. And there have been no indication on the part of the, the workers themselves working on the grower's farm that they wish these organizers to represent them. As farm workers looked for broader support, they faced a world they knew little about. When we went out, we had to lose all shame and be willing to ask for everything. And we were asking people to quit their jobs and drop out of school and come work with us full time. We were asking people to give us money. We were asking people to let us live in their home and sleep on their floor. We were asking people to feed us. And we were asking for paper, for leaflets, anything you could think of. We were asking for it because we didn't have it. And we needed it in order to do the boycott. The longest time was in Chicago. Caesar told me, just go out and stop the grapes and you can come home. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I was 21 years old, never been to any big city by myself, had no idea where Chicago was. And they gave me a bag of buttons, uh, one name of, of a supporter in Illinois, and something like $15, $20. I had no idea. No idea how I was going to live or support myself. My whole world had been a Spanish-speaking world, you know, a farm worker world. And all of a sudden, I had to go out and meet church people and unions and white people and all kinds of people. I was 
So a big experience. There were so many people that before the farm workers boycott began, they hadn't stopped to think about where the things that they ate came from and who was involved in getting the food on their table. The public really responded. They were very, very supportive. And then we took that support and put it and, and put pressure on the chain stores. We started then telling people, don't patronize this store. Go somewhere else where they will take a stand. The uh, retail food industry is sympathetic to their cause. Uh, we understand uh, what their problem is, but we just can't uh, subject ourselves to the demands that they're making. We tried to work with them, but they're not willing to listen. Little by little, the boycott strategies took hold in cities across the country as mayors and religious leaders came to support the farm workers' cause. Therefore, we have supported this great boycott in New York. Black Soon, Americans from all walks of life began to support the boycott. The F of L CIO joined in, and the boycott spread to Europe. In England, Sweden, and France, dock workers refused to unload California grapes. For young Chicanos and Chicanas in the cities, the farm worker movement became a pivotal experience. Many young people went to Delano and came away with a new sense of what it meant to be Chicano. I think it was the farm workers union that really became the heart and soul of the Chicano movement because it was the most visible in many instances, because it was the most vulnerable, because again, we were supposed to have been the most ignorant and unorganized and isolated, and I can go on, yet people were still out there taking a stand in some of the most dangerous, brutal, vicious conditions that you can imagine, and yet people were out there. So I think they were really an inspiration. Throughout the nation, farm workers had won support by nonviolent efforts, using pickets, boycotts, and marches. But back home, patience was wearing thin. The uh, strike started in September of 1965. And two and a half years later, we were still on strike. It's a very long time for people to be on a picket line, a very long time for people to be without things, I mean, without basic things. And so some folks were um, starting to say, well, you know, maybe this nonviolence thing isn't going to work. Another winter arrived, a hungry time for striking farm workers. Cesar Chavez was deeply troubled by union members who talked openly of using violence against growers. Caesar had read Gandhi. Caesar followed Martin Luther King in the South, and Caesar thought that the same tactics could be applied in an agricultural dispute. How long have you stab on your fellow workers? You say, uh, probably somebody else is going to win my battles and uh, I'm going to gain by it. That's not the point. If everybody thought that way, there wouldn't be a strike. We'll still be in the same lousy condition we were. We're not trying to... As voices grew angry, Chavez made a pivotal decision. On Valentine's Day, 1968, he began a fast, refusing all solid food, drinking only water. It was the ultimate nonviolent act, but it confused many of his followers. We didn't have a coherent union yet. Now, Caesar decided that since the rumblings were going on, he was going to show people uh, what Guts was all about, and he announced one day that he was going to march out to the gas station at the 40 Acres in Delano and fast, so people could think about nonviolence. It was a complete stunner. There weren't enough hours in the day, enough days in the week to do the work, just to keep the union moving forward. And here is the, the founder of the union, the leader of the union, saying, 
time out. There was a lot of grumbling about the fact that we needed Caesar as the leader of the day-to-day -day operation of the Union, and some felt that we didn't need a visionary at this point, or we didn't need a dreamer, or we didn't need a martyr, or we didn't need um, some type of religious figure of some sort. But we needed a hard-nosed organizer, a day-to-day -day person who was going to give direction and keep us moving. We had a press conference with all of the labor leaders in New York uh, to tell them about the boycott, this all-great boycott that we're going to be doing, but also at the same time to let them know that Caesar is fasting. They got very upset. I mean, they got, some of them became almost physical, you know. What's the matter with this guy? Is he crazy, you know? That isn't the way that you organize a union. And in Delano, a lot of the volunteers that had come to help us, they left. They left because Caesar was fasting. Because some people, in religious, some religious people that we had, they said, oh, he's trying to play God. They couldn't understand the spiritual power of, of the past. And it forced folks to reflect on the struggle and where it was at that point and whether or not we wanted to continue with it and whether or not we were willing to continue sacrificing in order to build the union. Chavez was ordered to appear in court for a hearing to determine if the union had violated an injunction by picketing the Jamara farm. Almost two weeks into his fast, Chavez was weak and his health had suffered. I remember waking up that morning and feeling pretty damn scared because here I had a guy, my client, who's on the 13th day of a fast, and I didn't know if these jerks were going to throw him in jail. So I went to pick him up early, and I remember it was a foggy morning, and coming out of the fog, the headlights of farm workers' cars started coming, and they just came endlessly. I felt so great to see all those workers headed to the courthouse. And we had about 3,000 workers uh, at the Kern County Courthouse. They were lining the walls, uh, they were very quiet, and Jamara's attorneys wanted to kick us out. And the presiding judge that day was a guy named Judge Osborne, and I remember going into his chambers and arguing with this guy Bill Quinlan, Jamara's lawyers, and Osborne said, basically, you know, Bill, if we kick these workers out, it'll be just another example of goddamn gringo justice. That fast transformed enemy territory into our territory because just, just the presence of 3,000 peaceful, nonviolent farm workers in the courthouse changed the attitude that the workers in the courthouse had toward the farm workers. They weren't misbehaving. They were human beings. So I think that Caesar's commitment to nonviolence did a lot of things. First, the general support of the American people was dependent on it. The boycott was dependent on it. But more importantly, that fast and that commitment, I think it was the glue that made the Union a Union. After 25 days, Chavez broke his fast at a mass attended by 4,000 supporters. Senator Robert Kennedy was at his side. Three months later, Kennedy was killed. Farm workers lost a friend and one of their strongest supporters. Bobby Kennedy's assassination was just a morale blow to all of us. It just was like a two by four to the head. Because um, he was not only a public figure, you know, to give visibility to this cause, but he, he was in his heart. And you could tell. By 1969, the farm worker strike was in its fourth year. Jamara and the other growers, undaunted by the national grape boycott or the strike, still refused to recognize the farm workers' union. And they found a powerful ally in the newly elected governor of California, Ronald Reagan. There is no grape strike. No one's been able to find anyone picketing the vineyards who ever worked in them. And the only contracts that were signed were signed between 
Mr. Chavez Union, and a few wineries that signed up under the coercion of his threats of boycott. The farm workers, faced with dwindling resources and low morale, renewed their efforts in many U.S. cities to expand the national grape boycott. What they did, they went to the East Coast, they went to New York. You have to remember, this was a time of the Vietnam War, the radical movement to the left. There was a strong movement the, uh, of this type. Well, they had hundreds and hundreds of people scattered in at least 50 cities. And they were pressuring supermarkets and uh, retailers not to handle grapes. By early 1970, the boycott began having an effect. Shipments to the top grape-consuming cities were down by 22% and continuing to fall. His boycott became uh, tougher and tougher and tighter and tighter. And I could see it meant um, destruction for most of the growers. In Chicago, Eliseo Medina realized that all his hard work was finally producing results. That was an announcement made by the chain stores. They were going to stop selling grapes. They were going to stop selling grapes. And then it's, oh my God, so we call California. You know what there is? Just said, we just got the same reports from Detroit and from New York and from all of these places. Reports started coming in that chain stores were doing this. That's what killed us. And we had stores tell us, look, we can be sympathetic to you, but we cannot tolerate this kind of damage. That's what brought us to our knees, not our workers. It is my belief that uh, in friendship with Cesar Chavez and with his workers, that this will be a constructive solution to the problem. I have some On April 1st, the National Farm Workers Association signed a contract with Lionel Steinberg of the Freedman Ranches. I will try as hard as they will try. We did uh, feel that he would be probably the first one to sign a contract, and he was because he did have a liberal reputation and uh, and also was a lot better with his workers than some of the other growers were. We knew he was a man with a conscience. I had the union label and immediately um, some of my customers, much, much to my surprise, started telephoning. They wanted to buy my grapes. And uh, in this respect, um, I did have a temporary advantage because my grapes are worth one or two dollars a box more than the non-union grapes were. The dynamic of having union grapes reinforced the power of the boycott because stores didn't want farm workers picketing in front of their, their, their front door. They didn't want any hassle, so they bought the union grapes. So the price of union grapes went up, there was a premium on union grapes. And the price of non-union grapes went to hell. My uh, competitors were very bitter. Here Steinberg is getting two dollars a box more and he can go to New York, he can go to Chicago, he can go to Boston, he can go to all these closed up cities and we can't do it. So several of the growers said that this is too good, we better get on the act too. You know, the union has a little black eagle, that's our union label, and growers were clamoring for that eagle. And then all of a sudden these growers who had hated our guts fell in love with us and we couldn't sign contracts fast enough with them. In July, the union's attorney, Jerry Cohen, received a late-night call from John Jamara, Jr. He and his father wanted to meet with Cesar Chavez. So we went to a room at the Stardust Hotel in Delano, and John Jamara, Sr. and Jr. came and said that they were interested in signing a contract with us. That was 12,000 acres of grapes. We were dying to get him, but we decided what we'll do is we'll tell John Jamara, we won't even sit down with you unless you round up every Delano grower. And we thought, well, this is pushing it, but why not? So we went to the meeting, and in the middle of the night, we said, you round up all Delano. And their response was, we'll have them at the St. Mary's School tomorrow morning. Caesar assigned me to do negotiations. And I guess the growers uh, complained about me. First of all, I think that they weren't used to dealing with women. And she's a Mexican woman. What could be worse from a grower's point of view? Dolores always stuck to her guns. And they, they said, uh, they being the grower, said Dolores drove him nuts. But I think the reason she drove him nuts is because she, more than anybody, stood for things that they couldn't stand. I mean, their workers were standing up to him. You know, some of the other uh, people, like 
the attorneys, like Jerry Cohen, would say, well, you have to be polite. You know, the attorneys have to be polite to them. And my thinking is, why do we need to be polite to people who are making racist statements at the table or are making sexist comments? I mean, I think when they do that, you have to call them at because then also you're educating them in the process so they can stop that kind of behavior. I'd say in some circles she was known as the dragon lady among the growers because she was the toughest of the bunch. So see, they didn't call her Dolores, they said the dragon lady. On July 29, 1970, the growers and farm workers met to sign the contracts at the Union Hall in Delano, almost five years after the strike had begun. It was a happy day and a great victory for the farm workers. We had been working so hard for so long for this that it was hard to believe that we'd won. It never, ever, ever, ever crossed my mind that it, it couldn't happen, not once. I always knew that we would be able to do it. And I think Caesar felt the same way. 26 Delano growers signed contracts guaranteeing farm workers $1.80 per hour plus 20 cents a box, a hiring hall, seniority, and strict pesticide controls. The boycott, the strike has been a costly thing, not only to us, but also to the employers. But I think that because even though how Ever unfortunate the experience might have been and the struggle on both sides, that because of that experience we have created the foundation to what I think is going to be a very good working relationship with the grower community in Delano. 10,000 miles begins with a single step. You've taken that single step. I wish you luck on the balance of the trip. And I hope that this is, with this foundation, you can move on to greater things and will prosper, and so will you. The signing of the table grape contracts was pretty heady stuff. Not all growers were happy with the outcome. I felt that I betrayed my workers. And the time when we did sign with him, that was not my workers' option. That was mine my brothers. I wouldn't have done it. I'd rather have died that day, I think, than, than have done it. But we did. Is this the turning point? Well, it's certainly the beginning, I guess. Uh, it's a turning point in, in, uh, in one respect, and that's, that's that uh, I think that now uh, there's no dispute that uh, we do have a union, but we have an awful lot of work to do. There was more work to do. The vast majority of farm workers remained without a union a condition that would mobilize organizing efforts for years. But in the cities and schools of America, inspired by the courage of the farm workers, a generation of Chicano youth were poised to open a new chapter in the Mexican-American struggle for civil rights. They were ready to take to the streets to demand a better education. In the fields, the farm workers' movement had left a lasting legacy of change. I think the greatest achievement is, is in the change that it made on people, uh, teaching them how they could fight, how they could stand up for their rights and win.